And today I read from the King James text as always. Matthew 15, 1 through 9. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Esaias prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now listen to this. But in vain do they worship me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So I want to talk briefly today on the topic, corrosive tradition. Master, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the presence of God in our service today. Lord, Sister Stephanie and her grandma, her family, are suffering and struggling today with the loss of a loved one. And we ask God right now, in the name of Jesus, that the love of God, the grace of God, the comfort of the Holy Ghost would come down upon their house, come down upon them, Lord, in a wonderful, mighty way. At this moment in time, wrap your arms around them. Help them, Lord, to know that in this hour their God has not left them alone. That you are there to comfort, to encourage, to inspire. Our faith informs us, Lord, that no man, no woman, no boy, no girl that believes on you shall be ashamed. And Lord, we trust today that Grandma is in the hands of a merciful, wonderful, gracious, saving God. We ask, Lord, today that he might know the peace, the joy, the everlasting comfort that comes from walking eternally in the presence of our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. Master, comfort Stephanie, her grandma today, those in her family, help them to wisely make choices and decisions that are to come in the days and weeks of head. Lord, I put a hitch around Stephanie in the name of Jesus, Satan. You're a liar and the father of lies. And I ask God to send his angels that they might stand around her as a hedge to stay. Protect her, Lord, from every temptation that might come her way. Master, strengthen her at this hour. Help her to look up in faith and not down in fear. Touch the messenger of God as the word of God goes forth. Help me, Lord, today to deliver a word of exhortation that might encourage, inspire, instruct the people of God. For we ask you today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, it's interesting how those who want to preach LGBT people in the hell. They love to come at us as though uh, this issue is the issue, you know. 
It is the primary issue, the number one issue that God is concerned with. Now, I will tell you, as a preacher of the gospel, and as one who has been called to prophetic ministry, I am likely to say things, A, that you've never heard before, and B, that uh, is rather foreign to your hearing. I want to tell you something, folks. A lot of times the truth is not in line with the tradition that we have been taught. A lot of what we believe today is born more of tradition than it is the Word of God. Jesus challenged the scribes and Pharisees that came to him wanting to know why his disciples did not follow and they said this the tradition of the elders notice they didn't say why do your uh, disciples not follow the scriptures that's not what they said why do your disciples not follow the Torah that's not what they said they specifically said, why do your disciples not follow the tradition of the elders? A lot of Christians don't realize that half of what they believe is based on tradition, not scripture. I'm going to tell you something. When we dedicate babies Honey, that is not scriptural. That is, there is no call in the Word of God. There is nowhere in the Word of God where we are told to bring our children and to present them and to dedicate them. No. That is a practice which is extrapolated from the Word of God based on uh, certain things we read and certain things we see in various places. We see, for instance, that uh, Hannah brought her son to the prophet and dedicated her child to the Lord and lent him to the Lord. We see where Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple so that they could present him to the Lord. But see, first of all, you have to understand, these practices were based on uh, uh, having to circumcise the child by the eighth day of their life. So that baby can only get to eight days old and he was supposed to be circumcised if he was a boy and if he was a Jewish child, okay? So therefore, this whole notion of them bringing their child to the temple is really based on the fact that they had to do this as it related to circumcision. We no longer, we don't practice that in the New Testament church. So therefore, the notion of bringing your child before their congregation and dedicating your child to the Lord is a nice notion. And I do it. If someone asks me to do it, I'll do it for you. But it is tradition. It is not scripture. Nowhere in the Bible is it said that you must do this or you should do this. Do you follow what I'm telling you? No. The same thing is true. Whoa, 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 whoa. Preaching's going to start getting into some deeper water and that water is troubled today. The same thing is true of marriage. While there are those in the evangelical community who want to make a big fuss about marriage, and marriage is only between one man and one woman, garbage, 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 garbage. Tradition, not scripture, tradition. What's tradition? The whole wedding ceremony is tradition. There is no part of any wedding ceremony, no part of it, that is directly prescribed in the Word of God. If marriage were some sacred institution, as it is taught by certain people, do you not think that God would have said, and when a man and a 
woman had decided they wished to be joined, I want you to speak these words over them. Or I want you to put a broom down and have them jump over the broom. Or I want you to wrap a glass in a cloth and have them press the, the glass under their foot as Jewish couples do in their wedding ceremonies. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? But nowhere in the Word of God, nowhere is any kind of wedding ceremony presented, taught, mandated, nowhere. Nowhere. Well, partly because marriage in biblical times was a very private, personal contract. It had nothing to do with the state. It had nothing to do with the government. And listen to me, children. It had nothing to do with the church. If marriage were some big, sacred Ritual. Why did God himself not do something that represented a marriage ceremony between Adam and Eve when he made Eve for Adam, but he did? That's right. A marriage is between a man and a woman. Well, first of all, mister, you're quoting what you think is scripture and you're on your third wife. Hmm. And according to my Bible, if the other two women you were married to are still living, guess what? You're still married to them. So you are, in fact, my Lord have mercy, a polygamist. That's right. Every divorced and remarried person on this planet, in the eyes of God, according to Scripture, not tradition, according to Scripture, is a polygamist. Oh, my word, have mercy. What do you know? They're also adulterous. In the New Testament, Paul taught, Jesus taught. This is New Testament teaching, not Old Testament, that if you're divorced and your former spouse is still living in the eyes of God, you're still connected to them. Once you connect to somebody, once you get with somebody intimately, you become connected to them in the eyes of God. That's why Paul said, you want to be careful about not connecting yourself to a whore. Because you may walk away from her, but in the eyes of God, you will forever be connected to her. So i got news for you. There are very few people on this planet who are not polygamists. Right. There are very few people in this planet who are not, in fact, in the eyes of God, married to more than one person. My this God. is one reason why we encourage people, and believe it or not, we're an LGBT affirming church, but we still encourage people to wait till marriage. Don't just give yourself up to every Tom, Dick, and Harry Amen. that comes down the road. I'll tell you, young person, listen to me. You are putting yourself out there more than physically. You are putting yourself out there emotionally. Amen. And you may be a little slut puppy who wants to say to me, oh, pastor, you're not supposed to talk like that. Hey, listen. Listen, the person I'm talking to understands exactly what I'm saying. You may be one of these who say, oh, I just enjoy the pleasure of it. I don't care. I'm not emotionally involved. I don't get emotionally attached to anybody. I just do my thing, and I'm done, and I have a good time. Yeah, and you think your emotions are not somehow engaged in the process. Got news for you. You get old enough, and you start looking back. And your emotions will be saying to you, man, I've been used like a rag. Ain't nobody cared about That's me for nothing. That's right. That's right. Amen. Ain't nobody cared for me. That's All right. they wanted was my body. That's All right. they wanted was I, what I could do for them. That's right. All they wanted was the pleasure I could provide them. I'm going to tell you something. After a while, I'll take it from somebody who knows what he's talking about. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. After a while, you start feeling pretty bad about yourself. Mm. After a while, you start feeling pretty lousy. That that guy 
can go to bed with you, but you know what? Never once will he invite you out for coffee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never once will he ask you to go to dinner with you. Oh, when I was out of church, I did some things. Things I'm not proud of, things I don't talk about. But I'm going to tell you a little personal tale today. And believe me, these are rare, so appreciate it. There was one person that I used to, every once in a while, I'd get a phone call. You know what we call booty calls. Oh, yeah. This one person had an interest in me, but it only went so far. That's right. And, and I wouldn't hear from him. For, and I really, really like this person. That, you know, if, if we could have pursued a relationship, I'd have been happy with that. And every time you turn around, I'd get this phone call. And we'd get together, and it would turn into something a certain way. I'm going to try, try to talk genteel today as though we had children in the audience. Let me tell you, folks, if, if you're out there and you hear this preacher preach, and you say, well, I can't go to that church. He talks too plain. I've got teenagers, or I've got kids. I've been in ministry a long, long, long time. If I had children in the audience, if I had kids in the audience, if I had young people in the audience, I meter how I say things, okay? Just so happens right now I don't have that, so I can talk plain. Yes, you can. All right? So I had these little, you know, rendezvous with this person every once in a while. But I was single, I was lonely, didn't have anybody, I really wanted somebody. One day I went to dinner at this little diner in New York City I used to go to. It was called Tiffany's, believe it or not. It wasn't associated with Tiffany's, but it was Tiffany's Diner in the West Village. All of you folk in the LGBT community, you know what I'm talking about. When I talk about Tiffany's, I don't think they're there anymore, but they were very kind of well-known back in the day. And I was sitting down there at Tiffany's, Diner, and I was eating all by myself, just sitting there by myself eating. And here comes this fellow walking in with somebody. And they walk in and they go and they sit at another table and they're chatting and laughing and eating. And I sat there. And all of a sudden, the thought went through my mind. I said, You know what? You sucker, I'm good enough for you to call when you're all horned up. But not once have you ever asked me to call me. Not once have you ever asked me to go to a movie. Not once have you ever asked me to go to dinner with you. Follow what I'm saying. And I'm going to tell you something. Some of you people out there who say, and, and let me tell you, for those who want to believe it's the majority of the LGBT community who are a bunch of sluts and they're just running around saying, I got news for you. I've been in this community a long time. And that is not the majority of the community. Right. Amen. That is not the majority of the community. That's right. The majority of the community wants more. The majority of the community, like most other people, are looking for something lasting and something of substance and something of worth. Am I telling the truth today? I'm going to tell you, you sit there and say, well, I'm just having a good time. It don't matter to me if that person likes me or doesn't like me, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, do it long enough and see if you don't wind up with psychological and emotional baggage attached to that behavior 20 years from now, 10 years from now. Don't stand there and tell me you can be intimate with person after person after person and you're not at all emotionally uh, involved. You're not at all emotionally invested. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Intimacy is so personal. And it is such a, a part of our human makeup. And you cannot separate sexuality from your emotions yes. at one place, at one level, or another. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Well, let me tell you about marriage. We got preachers that'll get up in the pulpit and preach you into hell because you're living with somebody, but you're not married. And listen to me carefully. I told you this preacher, I don't preach tradition, I preach truth. 
And sometimes it'll blow your mind because it's not what others are telling you. They're not married and they're living together and that's sin. No, no, no. You're doing what these scribes and Pharisees did. You're going to the Lord and saying, why aren't these people following the tradition of the elders? You're not, you're not talking the word of God. It's not sin because they are going against tradition. Okay. No. In the word of God, listen to me. Here's how you got married in biblical days. And this was straight up through the New Testament era. You found somebody you wanted to marry a man. And you went to her father and you offered him a dowry. You offered him a payment. Because in biblical times, the woman was in effect chattel. So therefore, you had to almost buy her. Okay? Because that woman contributed to her father's household. So you had to provide something to the father to compensate for removing that girl from his household. And you would present to the father a dowry. If the father accepted your dowry, you then became, in effect, engaged to that woman. Now, there was no announcements in newspapers. There was no, they didn't have those type of practices in biblical times. But you became engaged. It was a contract, an agreement between you, her, and her dad. The only way anybody would know is if you told them. Well, I'm engaged to, to this woman, you know. Now, what usually then would happen is the man would not necessarily remove the young lady immediately unless maybe he were very well to do. He might just remove her immediately. But generally speaking, once he had made the arrangement to marry her, he would go and he would make his home ready for her so that he could then bring her into his household and she could be happy and she could be comfortable. So he would make his home ready for the young lady. Then when the time was right and he had all things ready, he would go to her, he would gather her up with her things, he would take her home with him, and in private, they would sexually, I will say it plain, consummate their relationship. And at that point, they were married. Amen. Period. No ceremony. No church. No synagogue. No temple. No. They were married. news for you. I had somebody one time, I met this young woman, I think I was at a bus stop years ago, might have been in New York City, and I told her about our church. She was straight, I don't care, our church isn't a gay church, we're for everybody. There ain't nobody that cannot be ministered to in this church. And I said to her, I said, well, you ought to come visit our church sometime, and I told her about it. And she said to me, I haven't been to church in many years. She said, to be honest with you, and she became very sheepish, you know. She said, to be honest with you, she said, I, I'm living with my husband. And then she said, well, I don't need my husband. I'm living with my boyfriend, and, and we're not married. And I looked at her, I said, how long have you been living with him? She said, 18 years. I said, are y'all committed? Are you... Uh, monogamous and all that? She said, yes, sir. I said, honey, I don't know who told you you're not married. Good. That part. That's part. That part. I said, I don't know who told you you're not married. I said, but from a biblical standard, you're married. From a tradition standard, you're supposed to go and stand in front of the preacher and get a license and all that. I said, now listen, you may not be legally married, but you're married in the eyes of God. I said, as a matter of fact, if you and your husband came to me and said, we need counsel 
way. I would counsel you exactly the way I would counsel any married couple. I would do everything in my power to preserve your union and to preserve your relationship. The same way I would do everything in my power to preserve a marriage. He said, I don't know who told you you're not married. From a biblical standard, yes, you are married. I said, now here's the problem. In the modern world, there are protections and there are legal benefits to becoming legally married. I said, now the problem is you may be married in the eyes of God, but from a legal perspective, you could really get done dirty if something happened to him. His family could come in and they could claim his half of your estate, you know, his half of the house you own and his half of the car he drove and his half, uh, their, uh, yeah, his half of the money you've got in the bank. I said, now those things are not protected because you're not legally married. Legal marriage today in our modern world provides benefits and securities. I said, but in the eyes of God, you are in fact married. So you should not feel guilty. You should not feel condemned to walk into the house of God because let me tell you a little secret. When Jesus met the woman at the well, and he was talking to her and he said to her, hey, go get your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And he said, yeah, you ain't lying. You've been married several times, but the man you're with now, you're not married to. And she was shocked that he knew this. I'm going to tell you where a lot of preachers and a lot of Christians mess up in this story. They don't understand what really happened between the Lord and this woman. The Lord did not tell her, I know your legal status regarding marriage. It's not what he was saying. He literally, listen to me carefully, he literally read her mind. It wasn't a matter of her being legally married because there was no legal marriage at that time. Right. No. What he understood was, listen, yeah, you're living with a man now, but you're not committed to him in your heart as you would be to a husband. So he knew the state of her heart. He knew what was going on in her head and in her heart, and that is what shocked her. That is what stopped her in her tracks. That is what sent her back to the land of the Samaritans, the city of the Samaritans, say, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Hallelujah. He understood the state of her heart. Why? Because what we call marriage today is in fact tradition. The whole, the whole framework of modern marriage is based on tradition. Oh, to be married to someone you to go in and you have to have a marriage license and you have to put the baloney. I'm going to tell you something. Many LGBT couples that were able to get married after 2015 had been married a long time before they 2015 ever come along. That's right. That's right. All 2015 did was give them some legal cover and give them some legal benefits because that's what modern marriage is. That's all it does. It contractually binds you to another person so that in the event of death, you automatically inherit whatever was theirs, okay? How many LGBT couples, when they were not able to be legally married, were with a partner for many, many, I saw this happen several times, and it was heartbreaking every single time. I saw couples that were together 20 and 30 years, and when the partner died, the family came in and was able to claim half. 
of the house they bought together, of the cars they bought together, of the money in their bank account. They were able to claim all of his partner's clothing, all of his partner's furniture, all of his, everything that belonged to his partner. They were able to come in and take it because legally he had no cover, he had no protection. That is why LGBT couples, those of you today listening to me who are not LGBT, that is why marriage was so important to LGBT people, because they wanted to be able to have the same protections and the same legal rights. I knew couples that had been together 20 and 30 years, and when one of them grew very sick, and eventually died. The other was barred from even being able to go into the hospital room. Because at that time, there were no legal protections, there were no legal rights. He was not family. The family came along and told the hospital, we do not want this man coming in to see our son. We do not want this man coming in to see our uh, brother. We do not want this man coming in to see our father. Do you follow what I'm saying? And people went through so much heartbreak. They went through so much emotional torture, as it were, all because they did not have that legal protections and the legal rights afforded them by marriage. When Tommy and I got married, I said we were trying to figure out what we were going to do with the last name, you know? And I said, I'll tell you what, let's just take both of them, hyphenate them, and we'll both use the same identical. In other words, he won't be Morrow Burnett and meet me Burnett Morrow. I said, no, let's hyphenate it. We'll both use the same exact combination. That way, if anything ever happens to you, they'll know good and bloody well that I have a right to come in. They'll know good and bloody well that you and I are together because we share the identical same last name. I can show them my license and say, you see his license says Tommy Burnett Barber. You see my license says Charles Burnett Barber. You follow what I'm saying? A lot of couples I know, they decided, well, I'm just going to keep my name, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. And that's fine. I don't, it doesn't bother me. I don't care what you do. But to me, I'm going to make sure I try to build in as much protection as I can because I don't ever want to go through what I've seen others go through. And what they went through, Brother Timothy, was not anything that was related to Scripture. No. What they went through was related to tradition. Tradition is corrosive. Do you know what corrosion is? If battery fluid happens to drain down from the battery and it gets on the metal parts of the battery, corrosion develops. What a lot of people don't realize is, you notice my illustration today, sometimes you've gone out to your car, especially in years past, and you're trying to start it and it won't start, and you lift up the hood and you look at the battery, and there's all kinds of corrosion on the post. And you've got to take the connection off, and you've got to clean off all that corrosion. You've got to scrape it all off. It does not destroy the post. It does not destroy the connector that attaches to the post. All it does, oh, listen to me now, all it does is get in the way of the flow of power. Mm -hmm. My God. I'll tell you something about tradition. It doesn't destroy your relationship with God. There are a lot of people, I was talking earlier today about friends of ours who are Russian Orthodox, you know. All that tradition, all of that pageantry, all of the stuff that they do as part of their worship, does it destroy their relationship with God? No. These people are still people of genuine faith. Mm -hmm. 
And Brother Timothy, unlike a lot of apostolic, I don't take that away from them. I'm not saying they're saved. I'm not saying they're what they need to be. But I'm saying that the Word of God said if we would come to God, we must first believe that He is. And that He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. These people may or may not be on the right path, but they're at least looking. They believe God's freedom. They believe Jesus died on the I'm going to tell you, I'll, as long as I live, I will say this. Those Russian Orthodox people believe with every ounce of their being that Jesus went to the cross for them. They believe with every ounce of their being that on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead for them. Hallelujah. Their faith is real. to 
to be able to walk with God like that. I'm going to tell you something. If you had the opportunity to know Sister Veneer Chambers, that old lady I talked about last Sunday, if you had a chance to know her, I'm going to tell you what. You'd have had two visits in her house, and you'd have gone home hungry for the Holy Ghost. When you see what it's like for somebody to really walk in the Spirit, it makes you hungry. But if you don't ever get hungry for it, you're never going to get it. Because God don't shove sandwiches down people's throats who ain't hungry. Oh my Lord have mercy. Did you hear me today? Oh the children, I won't tell you a lot of people are out of church today. A lot of people in the LGBT community are out of church today. I've got to bring this to a close. A lot of people are out of church today because of tradition. Tradition has separated you from the power of God. Tradition has separated you from the move of God. Tradition has separated you from the touch of God, the presence of God. But honey, it has not destroyed the foundation. It's still there. You just got to get past the tradition. You got to understand there's a lot of things you've been taught that are not biblical, they are not scripture, they are the traditional viewpoint. A lot of what we're taught when, when I first came into affirming ministry, and I promise I'm trying to sew this up. When I first came into affirming ministry, and the Lord told me, first look at grace. So I studied grace extensively for months. But then, when I went to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, now read this like you've never read it before. Try to read it as if you've never read it before. And everything you've been told, about how to interpret certain things. He said, put that out of your mind. Just read it like you've never read it before. Put everything you've been told out of your mind. So I tried to do that. It's not easy when you've been soaked in tradition. And I read it. And all of a sudden I'm reading it as if I've never read it. And certain things are kind of standing out to me. And automatically I begin to ask some questions. I said, well, Lord, this one thing doesn't make any sense. If, if Sodom and Gomorrah were these big homosexual hangouts, if they were these big queer cities, why on earth would Lot want to live there? And how could he, Lot, live there, have two daughters, and both of them be married? If these are homosexual cities. And why would Lot offer his daughters to the people of Sodom when they came wanting to bring the angels out to uh, include them in their little religious idolatrous orgy? Why would Lot even say that if there was a bunch of homosexuals? None of that makes sense. None of it. So I begin to go back into the Hebrew. I begin to study a little deeper. All of a sudden I found out, holy mackerel, what I had been told this means, it does not mean. What I had been told this says, it does not say. I had a young man come to our church in Dallas some years back. He was the son of a Pentecostal preacher. He told me, he said, when I came out to my parents and I told them I was gay, he said they told me that they wanted me to leave their house, that they never wanted me to come back to their home, that I was dead to them, that they no longer wanted anything to do with me, yada, yada, you know the tale happens to far too many. He said, but a few
few months later, he said, my father called me. And my father said to me, I'll never forget it, because this young man's name was Michael. And I happen to have a brother named Michael, so that's how I'm able to remember the name. Because I'm terrible with names. Anybody who knows me knows I'm terrible with names. But Michael said to me, he said, a few months later, my father called me, and my father said to me, Son, your mother and I want to apologize to you. And we want to let you know that you're welcome to come home anytime you want to come home. And you're still our son, and we still love you. He said, when you came out to us, he said, I responded and reacted based upon everything I had ever known and everything I had ever learned and everything I had ever been taught and everything I had ever heard on the issue of homosexuality. He said, but after you came out to us, he said, I decided that I was personally going to go back to Scripture and I was going to investigate every passage that deals with this subject. He said, and I did. He said, but because the stakes were so high, it was my son, because the stakes were so high and I had skin in the game, as it were, he said, I really dug deep. I went into the Hebrew. I went He said, what I found is that just about everything I've ever believed is tradition. It's not the truth. He said, just about every single cotton picking thing that I have believed all these years, he said, it's just the same old Bible that's been handed down generation to generation to generation. He said, but when I actually finally did my homework for myself, I found out that I was wrong. If you're an LGBT person out there, you live in Nashville today, listen to me. If you don't live in Nashville, listen to me. Much of what has put you off of church, much of what has pushed you aside, much of what has motivated people to mistreat you, to ostracize you, to shun you, much of that is simply born of tradition. It's not based on the truth of God's Word. And God has sent a church for you. God has sent a ministry for you that can help you to understand the truth. Amen. So that you can scrape away the tradition. You can remove the corrosion. Yes, Lord. And you can reconnect with God. And the power can once again flow. Hallelujah. And you can know the Lord's presence in your life once again. And you can feel His grace. You can feel His mercy. You can feel His love. You can feel His embrace. Yes, 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 yes. All you got to do is understand that tradition is corrosive. But corrosive does, corrosion does not destroy. It simply interferes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Praise.